Well, Happy New Year to you, Faith Center. Let's try that again. Happy New Year, Faith Center. Happy New Year. Awesome. Well, if we haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Russ. Uh, I am privileged to be a senior pastor here, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this year. Uh, I want to pray in one more way before we jump into today's message. FYI, it's probably not you know, a sermon. It's going to be more of like a devotion, a short devotion that we can... Um, turn our attention to as we, as we start the new year. Of course, anytime a pastor says it's gonna be short, those are famous last words right there. Um, I wanna pray in one more way. I don't know if you're like me, but certainly when you have a week, a holiday week, where you sort of get out of your rhythms, you know, you stay up late with friends and family, you wake up early, um, you eat different types of foods than maybe you're normally accustomed to, you can feel a little out of whack. And so, um, or, or if you're like my son, I have a two-year-old named George, and last year, or last year, last week, it felt like a year. Last week felt like a year. But, uh, but last week, he, was, um, uh, he, he offered his body as a living sacrifice to the Holy Trinity for him, which was candy cookies and Pixar's cars. That was his Holy Trinity. So we got home on Friday, and you know, he wake, wakes up, he's excited, he's like, all right guys, let's, let's, let's put on cars. I'm, I'm excited to watch cars. I'm like, hey buddy, we're not gonna watch cars today. And he looked at me with a death glare, and he says, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> he didn't say that. He didn't say that. He doesn't say those words yet. But his, his soul said that. So maybe some of us are here today, and we're like, all right, we're here. We made it. The Holy Spirit somehow dragged us out of bed. Awesome. Welcome. Let's do one more thing. Let's pray together in one more way. Let's make our souls available to what God wants to speak to us today. Online, welcome. Let's make our souls available. There's an ancient prayer that uh, the church would pray um, which we've talked about before. It's just three words, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. And again, that is not a prayer. It's not that the Holy Spirit isn't here and then we suddenly invite him here and then he's here. No, no, God is already here. It's a prayer of permission. We're saying, hey God, I give you permission to come into my heart and into my mind. God is a relational God. He desires Full relationship, full reciprocity. He's not gonna force anything. He's not gonna overwhelm us or, or do anything that we haven't invited him into. He stands at the door and knocks, says Jesus. Whoever will open up the door, he'll come in and eat with them. So just for you know, 10 seconds, in your own heart, take a deep breath, knock the rust off of last week of your holy trinity of cookies, cakes, candy, and cars, or whatever it is for you, and let's invite the Holy Spirit in so we can hear what he wants to speak to us today. So just for 10 seconds in your heart. We do pray, come Holy Spirit. Spirit of the resurrected Jesus. Spirit of the living God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Moses, the God of David the God of Ruth, the God of Mary, the God who came in the flesh in Jesus Christ, the God who poured out his spirit on his first disciples on 120 in an upper room, the God of Paul and Peter and Andrew and James. Lord, you have been so faithful for year after year, for generation after generation. And whether we've had eyes to see it or not, you've been faithful in our own lives. You have been a steadfast presence. And often is the case, it certainly has been the case in my life, when I feel like I see you the least is when you're the most at work. And often it's not having to do with your presence or work, it's having to do with whether I'm looking for you. So God, I wanna be looking for you this year. We wanna be looking for you. So in this next bit of time, open our hearts to what you wanna to speak to us. Thank you for another day. Thank you for another year to gather and worship you. We don't wanna take a single moment for granted. Not a single song, not a single day. So Jesus, be the center. We love you. And it's in your name, God's people said, Amen. Well, like I said, today, uh, it's actually a special day, just kind of a, a one-off uh, message that we've titled The Same Jesus, The Same Jesus. Um, you may or may not know, but our church, we're part of a larger denomination, a larger family of churches called Foursquare, the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel. 
And if you were raised on the East Coast like I was, and you were told Foursquare, you're like, what's Foursquare? You thought it was that, that social media app that went defunct. Y'all remember that one? Like way back in the day where all the social media apps were jostling for position? That was Foursquare. Um, but that's not the only Foursquare there is. There's also a denomination, a movement that we are part of. And today, January 1st, our denomination turns 100 years old, which is really exciting. Yeah, give it up. <laughs> Happy birthday, Foursquare. <laughs> Um, later today, if for anyone who's so interested, there's going to be some festivities happening at our mother church, which is down in Los Angeles, called Angela's Temple. So if you want to tune in online, they'll be broadcasting those. It should be really cool. And I really love our movement. It's, uh, I mean, we're just one part of a larger kingdom, but we have some really cool things about uh, Foursquare. Foursquare was pioneered uh, from a woman. Her name was Amy Simple McPherson. And she was a revivalist preacher, uh, an evangelist who traveled around the country and eventually set up shop in Los Angeles. She was a phenomenal person. Uh, she was a human being, imperfect, just like every one of us, but there was an anointing and a grace and a vision that God gave her. And we are testament. We are, we are the inheritors of the vision that God gave her. One of the things that was described about uh, what is so cool about the Four Square Movement that I love um, is that it's interdenominational in spirit. It's interdenominational in spirit. So on the cornerstone, on the very cornerstone of the church down in Los Angeles, Angeles Temple, it says dedicated unto the cause of interdenominational and global evangelism, which I love that, which is to say we in the Foursquare movement, we're not about our own denominational movement. We're about the kingdom. We're not about ourselves. We don't care who gets the glory so long as Jesus gets the glory. We don't care. We're, we'll work with anybody. That was something about, about McPherson. She worked with anyone. She partnered with anyone. So long as people were lifting high the name of Jesus and offering the same life that Jesus himself offered in his own ministry to people, so long as that's happening, that's Foursquare. Sign us up for that. And when Angela's Temple was open on January 1st, 1923, uh, Amy Simple McPherson describes sort of the vision that she had for both that church, but also for the Foursquare movement, what would become the Foursquare movement. And I think it's a really great description for us. If you wanna know like, what is Faith Center? What are we about? What do we feel like God is inviting us into? Which we'll talk a lot more about that this year. I think this really epitomizes it. So she says, it's a great revival center to which thousands may come to find salvation, divine healing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, encouragement, rest, refreshing, an endowment of power for service, and where the prospective evangelist and worker may come for practical training and winning souls for Jesus. Amen. That sounds like a life I want to live, a people I want to be a part of. We're not extraordinary people. We're ordinary people who love Jesus and believe that everything that was about Jesus' life can be in our lives. We can find salvation for our souls. We can find that our sins don't condemn us anymore. We can find healing and wholeness for our bodies in the same way that Jesus healed people. We believe that, that the same spirit of Jesus is present to heal for our marriages, for our families, for our communities. We can find the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We can find that there is a, not only a, a baptism of water to which our souls are saved, but there's an infilling of God's resurrection spirit that guides us that convicts us of sin, that guides us into truth, that leads us. We can find that. We can find encouragement and rest and refreshing and endowment of power. I love this. An endowment of power, not for its own sake, but for service. We are called, as Pastor Julie said, to be the hands and feet to serve one another. And there's no giftings of power from God if it's not leading towards serving our neighbor. That is why we have it. And where prospective ministers and workers of the gospel can be trained, and knowing how to uh, persuade and, and preach and love and lead and win people to Jesus' love. So that's a really cool um, sort of spirit idea at the heart of who Foursquare is and at the heart of who we are. And what I wanted to do for this 100th birthday of Foursquare is just briefly turn our attention to the uh, chief Bible verse of Foursquare. 
So this was the verse that inspired uh, all of McPherson's theology and, and thinking about how scripture is lived out. Um, and I think for good reason. It's a powerful, powerful verse that it's incredibly short, but when we turn our attention to it, there's so much packed into it. And that's what I wanna do briefly today, or I say briefly, but that was only the introduction, so here we are, you know. Um, and it's Hebrews 13.8. Hebrews 13.8. In the middle of, uh, of the book of Hebrews, we read that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. I just want to pause and just have you just read that again. You can even whisper it out loud. Uh, Jesus Christ, he's the same yesterday and today and forever. This is the promise of God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. He's the same today and he will be the same forever. We might change. We will change. He does not change. He does not change. His power does not change. His ministry does not change. His heart does not change. His promises don't change. And when we turn our attention to this, this passage and we allow it to marinate, we meditate on it, we allow it to do some work, we allow the Spirit of God to do work on that passage in our hearts, a couple things come to the surface that I wanna direct our attention to today. Especially as this is the first day of the new year. I think this is an even more important passage for us. The first thing that this passage does to me, and I think to us when we look at it, is that it centers us. It's a centering passage. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is a centering and grounding passage. New Year's Day, right? Many of us in this room, we come into today with all sorts of resolutions, don't we? We have some goals, and I am championing your goals today. I am on your team. We come in with resolutions. We, we look back on the year, and we see weaknesses. We see things that we wanna change, things in our lives, things that sucked our time, things in our relationship. Aspects that we want to change. To change. There's, there's weaknesses, there's holes, and, and so we are hoping that we can find the strength this year, the, the resolve to change it. Uh, my dad worked for the YMCA all of his career, so we grew up as Y kids, and, and we always joked about this with tremendous compassion, tremendous compassion, but we always joked, don't go to the Y to work out on January 1st, go on February 15th. Usually, that's what you'd see. That's what they found, about six weeks um, where things sort of settled back to what they were in November or October. And, um, and I think there's, there's something to be said there, right? We find it in ourselves. I've certainly set goals before and not met them. Found that I didn't have the strength. I didn't have the resolve. And I think we all see that a bit. And that's actually a gift. That's a gift for us to come to terms with our incompetence, with our uh, inability to truly remedy our weaknesses. I, I love the way C.S. Lewis says this, and he's talking about our moral life, our life with God, but this is what he writes, and I, and I think it's right on. He says, now we cannot discover our failure to keep God's law except by trying our very hardest and then failing. Unless we really try, whatever we say, there will always be at the back of our minds the idea that if we try harder next time, we shall succeed in being completely good. Thus, in one sense, the road back to God is a road of moral effort, of trying harder and harder. But in another sense, it is not trying that is ever going to bring us home. And this is the important point. All this trying leads us up to the vital moment at which you turn to God and say, you must do this, I cannot. See, there is something about trying and trying harder and trying harder and trying harder, which brings us to a point where we recognize no matter how hard I try, I'm never going to find the wholeness I'm seeking. I'm never going to fix myself completely or fix the situation completely. Even though I set out this year with grand resolution, grand resolve, that this will be the year that we can fix X, Y, or Z, 
And again, I'm with you. I want wholeness and freedom in your life too. But the promise of the gospel is that that freedom and wholeness actually cannot be achieved through our efforts toward it. It comes when we realize that we're not the same yesterday, today, and forever, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we take our eyes off ourselves and the strength or weakness we think we bring to our lives and instead turn our intentionality, turn our focus onto him, there's a new sort of strength, there's a new sort of power that is released in us that starts to move us in a certain direction. And I'm not saying it means we're gonna become perfect, we're not. But it actually redefines what even the notion of perfection is. We find grace even in our shortcomings. And that grace leads us, it gives an endowment of power to continue to move toward freedom and wholeness. There's a centering in this verse that as we're tempted to come into this new year, perhaps same as ones in the past, see the weaknesses in our lives and turn our attention to fixing them. And I'm not saying that that isn't noble, but I am saying maybe, not maybe, let me just speak honestly, I don't think they're gonna be fixed by you focusing on your own strength or abilities. They will have a chance at finding freedom and wholeness if you turn your time and attention and power to seeking Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What if that would center us as we enter this new year? Not necessarily looking at ourselves, but looking at Christ. Saying, what would it look like to orient my life, my days, my skills around seeking him? And there's all sorts of ways we can do that, which we'll talk about this year. But one that I found to be of central importance and, and I don't say this lightly. I think I've said it from up here before. Um, my spiritual walk, my relationship with God changed dramatically when I started to incorporate this spiritual discipline into my life. And that's fasting. I did not grow up fasting. Uh, I actually like, had suspicion to, to churches and to pastors who talked about fasting. I don't know why necessarily, I just did. And then about five years ago, I was at a point in my life where there was some stuff breaking in me and I just had, I, I'd come to the end of myself as Lewis talks about. I realized I didn't have the strength in me to remedy these situations in my life that I wanted remedied. And somehow through, through divine providence, there was invitations to enter into a season of fasting and I did and it utterly changed the trajectory of my life. I began to see things of God, experience things of God, experience weaknesses in my own self uh, like I hadn't ever before. And so I found, and what I want to sort of submit to you guys for your consideration and your prayers, is what it might look like to start this year with me in 21 days of prayer and fasting. And really cool about this, this isn't just gonna be our church that we're doing it, this is gonna be our whole Foursquare movement. It's gonna be churches all across the country and the world that are gonna be engaging in a 21-day fast starting next week, next Sunday, uh, January 9th through January 29th with the whole Foursquare movement. Now, if you're unfamiliar with fasting, uh, the concept is actually quite simple. Historically, people would fast from food. They would go without food uh, for a certain period of time and the reason for that, because obviously food is something you need to live. You need it for survival. It gives us strength for living. But they would go without it and rely on a deeper strength, a spiritual strength. They would turn that hunger into seeking the Lord's presence, the presence and, and the love of God. When Jesus himself, who fasted for 40 days before his ministry began, when he was tempted by Satan, he actually quoted Deuteronomy to him because Satan said in one point, he said, hey, just turn these stones into bread, feed yourself. And he goes, man does not live on bread alone, but man lives on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What's he saying? He's saying that there's actually a deeper strength to our lives, to our very existence, than physical, biological strength. There's a spiritual strength. There's a spiritual life that we're longing for. We talked about that all this fall. 
There's a life that we're longing for. And that life is found when our energy and our strength is not coming through different substances or, or different activities of this world. It's actually coming solely and exclusively from our relationship with God. And one of the ways that we can intentionally seek and pursue that relationship is going without certain things in our lives and in their place seeking the Lord. So here's my definition for fasting. Here's how I defined it. Fasting is going without a certain fuel source, something that gives your life meaning, purpose, or a sense of identity, and instead turning our hearts, minds, and bodies to the person, words, and presence of Jesus Christ. So maybe that's a meal. For my son, it's Pixar's cars. That's, fa- that's what he's gonna be fasting from for 21 days. <laughs> he is not happy about it, he doesn't know it yet, don't tell him. But what, is, what are those things that gives your life a sense of meaning? A sense of purpose, a sense of strength, a sense of stability, a sense of comfort, a sense of control, a sense of power, that perhaps you're relying on those things too much when your soul was made to rely on Jesus, on relationship and communion with God. Not just just a relationship with God, but a deep intimacy with God. You can have all types of relationships some healthy, some unhealthy. God wants deep intimacy with us. That's what we see in Jesus, and guess what? Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and because he told his followers that if you abide in me, you're gonna do even greater things than me, that's available to us. Can someone say amen to that? That's available to us. Whether you believe it or not, it is. But often there are other forces at work that are trying to tell us that it's not available to us, or don't do it, it's too scary, it's gonna cost too much. Yes, it is frightening to step out of a boat and follow Jesus. It is frightening and it is costly, the things that we lay down because they've brought us such comfort and stability. But now being five years later into this journey and a lifetime of following Jesus too, it is so worth it. The intimacy with the Spirit of God is so much better than any sort of strength or stability I got from other things. So it could be a a meal for you. If you've never fasted food before, I would caution you with that one. Be careful, maybe it's a type of food, be wise. Or maybe it's something like a technology, a phone, a, a device, TV, a show. Maybe it's a certain behavior. I had a friend one time who I loved to death, but dude was just a cynical son of a gun. And I knew why he was, he had a lot of pain, but like he could not go a moment without being cynical about something. So he felt convicted by the spirit and for 40 days he fasted cynicism. It was so hard. (laughs) When something would happen and he would feel the cynical response rise up, he would instead bless the Lord, praise the Lord and then pray for that person or that situation. And it was so cool for him. Like it was really freeing and liberating. Maybe there's a certain behavior, right? Now, if you're wondering what what it might be for you, here's a couple questions. What is something that going without it for 21 straight days fills you with anxiety? (laughs) Like right now, if you're thinking, man, I can't have that thing for 21 straight days, I get nervous. Whether you decide to go without it or not, that might be pointing at something, poking at something that you're finding a bit too much comfort or stability or control from instead of the freedom found in intimacy with Jesus. Or what might God ask you to put down for a season to attune your soul to him? As we enter into this new year and we realize that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, I would say that one of the best ways to attune our spirits to all that he is and all that he has for us and for you and your lives, your your family, your marriage, your vocation, is through the practice of fasting. So I would invite you over this next week to pray, Lord, what would you have me set down 
so that I can not just do nothing in that place, but in, that play, in its place, attune my heart, orient my time around seeking the Lord. This verse centers us. It centers us on our rightful fuel source, what we were made to live from, what Jesus lived from. The power that Jesus had was not in a certain kind of bread he ate. The power that Jesus had, as he told us, he goes, I don't do anything except what I see my father doing, and I don't say anything unless my father has said it. The power that emanated from Jesus' life, which can be available for our lives too, is deep communion and intimacy with God. So what are those things filling our hearts that we set down so that we can know that intimacy too? The second thing I see in this verse, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, is that it's an incredibly comforting verse. It's a comforting verse because I do look at my own life and I realize that I'm not the same, that I do change like the waves. My emotions are all over the place. I have really good days and then I don't have a night of sleep and I have a really bad day. I'm not the same, but Jesus is the same. There's another verse in 2 Timothy 2.13 where we're told, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. If you are faithless, which if I asked a show of hands, that would be every hand in this room, Jesus remains faithful. Why? Because Jesus is the faithful one and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. See, as we enter into this year, allow it to comfort your souls that we might be different or maybe we're hoping that to become different in all sorts of ways. But our hope is not in our strength, our hope is in his strength. Our hope is not in our ability, our hope is in his ability. And all the promises of the gospel remain true and available to you and to me. There is comfort in knowing that we are saved because Jesus was strong, not me. There is comfort in knowing that as far as the east is from the west, so far has God, through Jesus, removed my shame and my guilt. There's comfort in knowing that no matter what happens this year, guys, no matter what happens, whether it is a unremarkable year as Pastor Julie prayed, or maybe there's some remarkable things to happen, I don't know. No matter what, God will love you no more one year from now than he loves you right this very instant. And he loves you no more, no less today than he did a year ago. He's the same. He's the same. His promises are the same. It's not on your shoulders to fix the world. It's on Jesus's. So take his yoke and come follow him in 2023. I love also C.S. Lewis, he puts it. He says, to have faith in Christ means, of course, trying to do all that he says. There would be no sense in saying you trusted a person if you would not take his advice. Thus, if you have really handed yourself over to him, it must follow that you are trying to obey him, but trying in a new way, a less worried way, not doing these things in order to be saved, but because he has begun to save you already. Not hoping to get to heaven as a reward for your actions, but inevitably wanting to act in a certain way because a first faint gleam of heaven is already inside you. Such a great reminder. Guys, it is comforting to know that we don't have to save the world and save ourselves, nor our families. It is comforting to know that all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. It is comforting to know that I can begin to live in a new way, not because I'm trying to earn his love, but because I've already received and experienced his love. Not because I'm trying to get to heaven, but because I've caught a glimpse of heaven in Jesus Christ, and that's inside of me, and I want more of that. I don't have to earn anything. I have all the time in the world to, as Lewis says, try, but in a less worried way. I don't have to be so worried or anxious this year. I can walk in freedom, walk in my broken, in, in my stumbling, my brokenness that is becoming whole. It is becoming whole, but I don't have to be worried about when I get there. He'll get me there. He knows all the hairs on my head. He knows all the hairs on your head. You don't need to worry. He's got you. He has got you. 
The only thing you need to do is pray every day. Come, Holy Spirit. I give you permission to this day. Show me who you are. Move me. Let, let my intimacy with you be the most important thing I seek in 2023. So there's comfort in this verse that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It centers us, it comforts us, and the last thing it does is it convicts us. It is a convicting verse. And for this last one, I I sort of went to write down notes and then I sensed the Holy Spirit saying, hey, don't worry about notes, I'll just give you words uh, in the moment. So this is where it becomes not a short sermon and we're gonna be here for another 30 minutes. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) But there's conviction. There's conviction in this verse. Because there are all sorts of passages of scripture, some I already mentioned, where Jesus says to his followers, hey, if you abide in me, these things you've seen me do, you're gonna do them. You're gonna do greater things than these. If you abide in me, you can say to this mountain, be moved, and it will be moved. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, do you know what's possible? And Much of these verses, it's important to say, are not directed to individuals, but directed to the collective, to the church. I was talking to a friend the other day, and we were talking about prayer, and he said, you know, when when you're praying alone, that's a discipline. You're practicing, you're growing in the fundamentals, but when you pray together, that's warfare. That's when there's actually contending happening against principalities and powers, because guys, I usually avoid militaristic language for different reasons, but I mean... Paul doesn't, and I need to be very clear. There is a war. As C.S. Lewis says, we right now are behind enemy lines. There is a war going on. And do you know where that war is being fought? In each and every one of your souls. There is a vying for power. Whose voice will you listen to? Whose reality will you enter into? Will you be caged up and bound by all sorts of darkness, by all sorts of negativity, toxicity, all sorts of judgment and shame and bigotry, or will you give your heart over, will you surrender to the person and the power of Jesus Christ who is available, who came to set us free? That's exactly why he came. He did not come to bind us further. He came for freedom Christ has set us free that we may walk as free sons and daughters of the living God. Walk in power, walk in encouragement, walk in comfort, walk in strength, walk in love, walk in grace, walk in truth, walk in all these things that we want, but it comes in him. And I think why this verse is convicting, certainly for me, because I can look back on periods of my life and even periods of my preaching where I preached a small gospel, I did. I preached maybe one aspect of Jesus, that Jesus can save us from our sins, which is true, praise the Lord, amen. He does. That for those who are in Christ, who have given themselves over to Christ, given their lives over to him, that we can be held secure because he's the same, held secure by God, and we do not need to be afraid of sin and death, no matter what. But if I only stop there, if we stop there, we are cutting ourselves off from so much of who Jesus is and so much of the power that is promised to be present in your life. The name Foursquare, if you're curious, where does it come from? (laughs) It actually comes from McPherson's theology of who Jesus is, which is really important. We are a Jesus people. That's who we are. We focus our attention on Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But as she examined the totality of Jesus' ministry, she found four elements. There's more, four primary aspects of who Jesus was, which made up the four square. That Jesus is our savior. He does save us. When we can't save ourselves, when we say, as Lewis says, I can't do this, you must do this, he saves us. His strength saves us. Not our strength or our weakness. But Jesus is also our healer. That there is healing that comes when we lift high his name and we lift high his name collectively. 
all sorts of spiritual healing, physical healing, relational healing. God, the presence of heaven, when there are souls here who are lifting high Jesus in faith, the presence of heaven breaks in and there is healing. There is healing. McPherson, where she went, there was all sorts of healing and, and attested to her. She never wanted to focus attention on it because it distracts us from the point, which is intimacy with Jesus. That's the best thing there is. Healed or not, intimacy with Jesus is what we were made for. That's what's available. But there is healing. He's our baptizer. The third thing, he's the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, which I mentioned earlier. It's not just a baptism in water for repentance, as Paul will say in the book of Acts, but it's actually an infilling of the very spirit and fire of God, the presence of God that leads us into all righteousness, that leads us away from those thoughts that are keeping us bound, those behaviors that are keeping us bound that leads us into right relationship with him and with one another. We might look silly to the world, but we'll feel free as we live into it. And that promise is for you. His Holy Spirit is for you. And lastly, and this one, interesting, maybe you think the healing or the baptizing of the Spirit is uncomfortable or weird. This last one we've stopped preaching about entirely. And I was thinking about it recently, and I know why we have, but I think it's important. The last of the four squares is that Jesus is the soon coming king. He's coming. That's the promise of his promise and of his angels that he will come again that God has appointed Jesus to judge all the nations, to judge every heart one day. And we've avoided it because, for two reasons, I think. One, there have been some pastors who maybe took it a little too far and named a specific date, which scripture told us no one knows that, so that was a bad idea, first of all. But second of all, I think we've avoided it because it can, when it's used improperly, We can sort of focus so much on getting to heaven that we lose sight of our neighbors right across the street from us. But I don't think that's what the purpose of this this idea is trying to do. It's not trying to say, let's just focus on heaven. No, it's saying heaven is present here. And what would it look like to live every day, and not the way your mom used to threaten you with this one, but to live every day with the knowledge that he's coming soon. He is coming. We're not left here as orphans. He told his disciples that. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming back. And that knowledge, that awareness that he is resurrected, he's alive, he's present, almost like in this new sort of dimensionality as human being 2.0, the first human to defeat death and be raised from the grave. He's present, but he will return from the clouds, with the angels, and every eye will see at that point, and every heart will know, and all of us, whether we want to or not, will fall to our knees and say, you're worthy, you're the king, you're the powerful one, you're the righteous one. There is a certain aspect where that knowledge, that realization that he's coming, that he's coming, helps us prepare ourselves for his return. And I don't want to shy away from that. And I'm not saying let that knowledge, don't go start collecting cans of beans or anything. I'm not saying that. Give those cans of beans away to your neighbor. But I am saying let that knowledge not lull us into complacency or lethargy. Because I think that's the alternative. It keeps us with a sense of urgency, a sense of recognizing that every day is a gift. Every time we get to worship is a gift. We don't know if it's our last, whether because he's taking us or he's coming first. So let us come into his gates. Let us come into his presence with eagerness, with expectancy for how his presence in heaven is gonna break out among us today. It's convicting because Jesus hasn't changed in the ministry that he said that my church, not individuals, but my church will live into. That The promise of that has not changed, and it's for us, and I want it. 
I want it. Maybe I should have started with the convicting one and ended with the comforting one. (laughs) But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so what I do want to end with, and I'm going to invite the band back up. I don't know what this year has in store for us as a nation, for you and your families, for us as a church. But I know he's the same. He's the same. And I know that the more we fix our eyes on him and the more we orient our lives toward knowing him, toward surrendering ourselves to him, the more we see the power of heaven break out in our lives and in our church. And that's, that's what we're truly after. So again, we're kicking off with a fast starting next week. This week, what would it look like to pray, to seek the Lord, to say, Lord, how are you inviting me to participate in this? What do you want from me? What do you want me to set down for a season so that I can intentionally go after you? And also next week, our sermon series for the month of January and for this fast is gonna be Come Full, which if you remember, we did that series in the August. We're gonna return to it. I, I sense the Lord inviting us. This is gonna be a recurring series in our church because Come Full is not about the, the themes that we'll cover. That will change. It speaks to a philosophy of our gatherings, That when we show up on Sundays to worship, we're not showing up empty. As far as it's available to us, as far as we're able, we're not showing up empty. We have been seeking the Lord Monday through Saturday. We've been turning our attention to him. We've been longing for his presence. So as my friend said, we've been practicing. So when we show up here, there's a new sort of electricity from the Spirit of God present and available for all of us to minister to one another. So what would it look like for us to show up these next couple Sundays, not empty, but full of God? And with that, stand to your feet, as I definitely should have ended with the comforting one and not the convicting one. And we're gonna say a word of prayer, we're gonna sing a song of response, and we're gonna respond a couple different ways. So I wanna invite you forward. We have communion in the front and in the back. Uh, Communion is a symbolic action of surrender. It's us saying that the strength for our lives and our souls is not in us, it's in Jesus. So maybe either for the first time or just as a rededication, go and receive communion. We have gluten-free elements at the center of the table too for anyone who, who requires that. We'll have prayer teams in the back. Maybe you need a prayer of dedication, a prayer of offering, of your life, a prayer that centers you or your family. Our prayer team, they walk with Jesus. They would love to join you in prayer. Maybe you wanna come forward into this space as your own sign to the Lord. Lord, this this year is gonna be about you. It's not about me. I'm gonna fix my eyes on you. But for all of us, and this is something I wanna invite us all into, both today and as we move into the new year, What would it look like if we sing a little bit louder? And a little bit louder now. And then a little bit louder now. And a little bit louder now, I'm just kidding. It says all throughout the Psalms, all throughout the Psalms, to praise God with loud singing. There's something, and we all know it in different ways. All these responses are examples of it. There's something when what's happening inside of us becomes what's happening outside of us, where there's an integration. There's no filter. Have you ever wondered, and I'm, I'm going too long, I'm sorry. Have you ever wondered in Pentecost when, when they're filled with the Holy Spirit why they're accused of being drunk? You ever wondered that? Here's what I think it is. What do drunk people not have? A filter. <laughs> Inhibitions. Their insides or their outsides. What if that's what they were seeing in the followers of Jesus? They had no inhibitions. They, didn't, they, they just loved Jesus and they didn't care who knew it. That was my quote of Elf right there. <laughs> right? They just loved Jesus. They weren't holding anything back or inside. Whatever was on their inside was coming out without agenda. They had no agenda for other people's lives. They didn't care. They just knew that Jesus had touched them and they could not withhold their praise because he was worthy of it all, amen. 
So what would it look like for all of us to take a step collectively so we don't feel like we're alone in this, to sing a little bit louder, to worship a little bit more, to come out of our box a little bit more, not for one another's sake, but first for Jesus' sake, but then you'd be surprised how as we can see the faith of one another, and guys, we're in the round, so we are seeing each other, but as we see the faith of one another, that inspires faith in us. That's that collective warfare that we're talking about. We need to see one another worship. So what would that look like for us as we start this new year off? To say, you know what, Jesus? You can have it all. You can have it all. So let's pray together. Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the same. And where we have forgotten that, where we have lost sight of you, or maybe we haven't given you everything, forgive us. We know you do. Your heart is so ready to forgive. Your heart is so ready to embrace. Your heart is so ready to pick us up and make us strong and fill us with faith and send us out whole with the gospel message of liberation, of freedom, of hope and healing for all the nations. It just doesn't come in our own power or strength and we don't get the glory from it. You get the glory. And so, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room, whatever they're going through, whatever they've entered with, I pray in this next bit of time, Holy Spirit, that you would minister to them and that they would give you permission, that they would open the doors of their hearts for you to minister to them. That they would feel challenged and convicted for ways that they have made you small. The ways they have relied on their own strength instead of walking in the power of your spirit. Ways that they have chosen their own control or comfort or security more than relationship and intimacy with you. But Lord, I also pray that they would feel so comforted knowing that you are not a judgmental God. You are not a condemning God. You are the absolute opposite of that. You are so full of grace and so full of mercy and so full of love for them that at the slightest instance of them opening up their hands and their hearts to you, you will rush in with power and joy and peace. God, I pray for our church that we would see one another's faith and that you would supernaturally fill us with faith this upcoming year that all the ministries of you, Jesus, as you walk this earth, would fill our community, that we would be that people where it is commonplace for healings to happen. And we wouldn't even give them a second look because it's not about the healing. It's about us being healed in relationship with you. But that they would happen, Lord, where miracles would happen, where there would be a great baptism of your Holy Spirit, and where we would live with the certain knowledge that you are returning soon. And that's a gift. That's a great thing that we all look for. Because when that happens, Lord, we will be free. As Paul says, right now we see in part, but then we will see fully and completely. Right now we are, we're experiencing freedom, but we don't fully know it yet. Then we'll fully know it. Let that knowledge inspire us in how we live, Lord. So Lord, we just wanna set this day apart. The 100th anniversary of our movement, thank you for that. And we want to offer our church up for another 100 years for you, Jesus. We wanna offer our lives up. We wanna offer our families up, generations after generations. The generations in our line that we will never see, Lord, we pray for them. We ask that they would come to a saving knowledge of you, Jesus, and that they would follow you with all their lives. We're not just doing this for ourselves. We're doing this for future generations. Use us, Lord. Use us, Lord. We worship you as you only deserve. Amen.